Hello everyone, uh, I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions, a program that focuses on your questions about life. This new year brings with it both challenges and circumstances that uh, we will face this year. And it is always a blessing to find biblical solutions to help us overcome. Well, with me today are four local ministers of the gospel who have been prayerfully reviewing your viewer questions about life. And they are armed with biblical solutions today and I'd like you to meet them. First up, we have Pastor Brad Taylor of the Lima Community Church, followed by Pastor Chris Langstaff of the Bell Center Church of Christ. Next in line is Pastor Neil Whitney of the Church at Allentown, and rounding off our panel today is Pastor Rich Reiki, and he is the Director of International Ministries at Teens for Christ. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all with us today. Thank you. All right, uh, we've got a nice list of some very juicy questions. Let's get at it. One viewer writes in, um, I, read the or I read the following quote on social media, and it says, quote, the best evangelism is always done without saying a single word, end quote. And uh, the people commenting on the quote say it is against the Bible not to use words when evangelizing. And that person is quoting uh, Romans 10, 17. I'll have you read that in a moment. Uh, and then the viewer goes on to say, I always thought my actions were a part of my witness. Um, why, are we, why are so many people against the idea that evangelism can happen without speaking? Or am I on the wrong thinking here? Um, Pastor, what do you, Pastor Reagan, what do, you, what do you think about that? First of all, read that verse. Sure. Read Romans that. 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So obviously the, the, the message of the cross has to be proclaimed in some way, shape, fashion, or form. But when I read this question, the first thing that came to me is I, I was a, a good kid. So I was that typical kid in cool school. I stayed to myself. I was quiet. You know, I was that nerd that got the award for being like the Good Citizen Award or whatever for the teachers. Um, but my, my greatest regret as I got older was that no one in my school knew why I was that kid. And when, you know, accepting Christ at 14 and kind of growing up in the church since about second grade, and being very, very involved in church activities and mission projects and different things. But that, I never really spoke about Jesus in church. I just tried, in school, I just tried to live it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the greatest regret in my life is that there were friends and classmates that had no clue that it wasn't me, it was Jesus mm -hmm. that was making the difference. And so I think the the person who asked the question is right. My actions are a part of my witness, but they're not the full witness. Very good, very well put. What do you think? I think that I totally agree with you, Pastor Rich, that um, they, there has to be a balance. There's got to be a blend. And, you know, I think about, uh, we look at a, a passage like Romans 10, 17, that seems to make it clear that the message has to be spoken. But then you also think about a passage that, where Jesus says the world will know you are my disciples by the are way you that you love one another. Sure, and sure. It's, I think it's pretty clear scripturally that we must, uh, we must live it and we must speak it uh, to, have that, to have that balance. And that, must love that it, need. yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. The, this seems to be a, um, a reference to the, the quote that's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Right. Um, <laughs> understand what that is about and, and what the, the, uh, the question is really asking. But, uh, you know, like, like you said, if, if we have the word of Christ in us, which Jesus tells us, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Um, so in essence, when we, when we act our faith, we're obeying the, the word of Christ. And sometimes again, Bill, like you mentioned, maybe the workplace doesn't really allow us to openly and overtly share our faith, yeah, yeah. but I think when we when we do model Christ in our actions and, and the things that we do, that could open up a dialogue sure, later, sure. Uh, maybe away from the workplace exactly. or, or at, a, at a time where uh, the Holy Spirit can can go between mm -hmm. our words and, and our actions. 
uh, and and we could you know possibly lead that person to Christ. Mm -hmm. But but to say that that the best evangelism is done without ever using words, I, I would I would kind of kick back against that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Are there nonetheless? And I agree with you wholeheartedly what you said. Are there nonetheless circumstances where people when they when they don't hear you saying or preaching the word, that they are in fact reading your life. If they're not reading their own Bible, they don't have a Bible, they don't believe in the Bible, can they not read your life? And cannot Christ speak through your life? There's an old saying, uh, <clears throat> your, your life is the only Bible some people will ever read. Yeah, right. yeah. So when I look at that question, I, I always look at Jesus, he's my model, he's my hero, he's my friend, he's, he's my everything. <laughs> Uh, I asked the question, did Jesus use words? Mm. Go from there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was there times when Jesus didn't use words? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the Bible's all about balance. I think about the time they brought in the adulterous woman who was caught in the act of adultery, yeah. and they, they were trying to get an opinion from Jesus as to whether the woman should be stoned yeah. or not. And he reached down and yeah. just started yeah. writing yeah. on the yeah. ground. He yeah. wasn't yeah. saying a thing. Mm -hmm. But his actions were saying some things. He, he Just be led by the Spirit. Yeah. 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 I, I think to, you know, to start the whole session off, it's very, very important for people not to develop a theology on one verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what, what Neil is saying is using the whole context of Scripture. So we take that verse from Romans, we take the life of Jesus, we take everything, when you put it together, now a clearer picture evolves as opposed to saying, well, trying to say that this is the only verse that speaks about evangelism is, is not accurate. Right. Yeah. right. So, so our actions, along with the words and the things that we say, you know, like, like you were saying, the, it all forms our witness. And to, to emphasize one and ignore the other, I think, is, is a mistake yeah. um, regardless. I mean, Jesus was a master storyteller. Mm -hmm. You know, he mm -hmm. was able to, to use everyday examples that made heavenly points. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's our responsibility also. Yeah. I think people today, you're absolutely right. I think people today, people love stories. And very often that's what can really bring it home to them is when they hear a, a true good story. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Well, let's move on here to questions. This next question on your list is question number five, and I think question number six dovetails into it. This is the time of the year that many people decide to start reading the Bible. What suggestions do you have to help ensure this new habit will kick in? Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's directed particularly to people who don't or are not in the habit right. of reading their Bible. Um, yeah. So, Bill, I think that uh, first of all, the you know as we as we've turned the calendar to the new year, a lot of people are thinking about things they might ought to change or, or you know, new habits they want to pick up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we would all say as pastors that we would hope that if there are people who are engaging in their faith who aren't actively reading scripture, that they, that ought to be part of our practice yeah. uh, in, our, in our walks with Jesus. And so well, I think one of the first things I would say to somebody who's in that situation is to be reasonable with your expectations. Don't Meaning what? <laughs> so don't expect that if you've not, if this hasn't been part of your life at all, don't expect that this week you're going to start two hours every day reading your scripture. It's just not realistic. Uh, find, a, find something that's reasonable. Bite off a, a piece that you can chew, you know, before you dive into um, that. This is what spiritual growth is. Over time, you give yourself more to it. You, yeah. um, you allow more. You, you thirst for more of it over time. And so I think uh, just being reasonable up front, you know, not feeling like you've got a... a, a tackle a certain amount or a certain amount of time, something like that. So time management really comes yeah. into play. Here, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Simply do it. Yeah. So uh, no matter how little or there's so many right. apps out there now that, I mean, you can listen to the Bible, you can play the app. It can be a verse of the day, it could be a chapter a day, it could be, you know, whatever is digestible, it could be a lesson. Just do something. Anything that you do is better than what you're not doing now. That's right, that's right. And, and, but I would also say give yourself grace. So if you miss a day, don't chuck the whole habit for right, the year. Right. You know, if you, if you stumble February 1st, don't think, well, the, the year is shot. You know, yeah. just pick back <laughs> up and keep going. Yeah. And so uh, I, I think just getting into it, wetting your appetite is key. Yeah. Okay. Pastor, you, you want to have anything to say about that? 
Uh, number one, anything you're going to do, have a great why. Why am I doing this? Sure, sure. And what do I expect to uh, attain through doing this? So why am I doing it? What do I expect to attain? And then the third thing would be have an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. ah. Now, how would that be used? How do you execute or implement that exactly? The, the, the partner? It doesn't have to be a live accountability partner. It can, be, it can happen through texting. It can happen through email. It can happen once a week at church. What uh, dialogue are they exchanging in, in this? Um, in oh, this it's exercise? just basically a friendly accountability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you do this week what you said you were going to do? Yeah, that's yeah. Good. It's just that simple. I have a lot of people who hold me accountable. And if I didn't, I wouldn't make much progress on my own. <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, we're going to take a break right now. When we come back, though, a, a related question, and this viewer is asking, what is the relevance of the Old Testament? So as we consider reading the Bible, taking up devotions and the like, should the Old Testament be considered in that process as well? We'll deal with that and more when we come back. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we thank you for staying with us. And here's our next question. It's related to the question we just got through studying, uh, basically. I'd like to hear a discussion about the relevance of the Old Testament for modern day. Is it relevant? Why do, on, uh, why do we only follow certain standards or guidelines presented and not others? And who determine what, who determine what we will do and won't do? You know, there are some things that carry over from the Old Testament to the New, and there are some things that are, that are abandoned now that we're in the New Testament. Part of it has to do with how you view Scripture initially. So what, what is this book, and what's it for? That's a basic question. And the way I frame that question in, in discipleship is, this is God's authorized biography, right? This is God's revelation of Himself. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't just the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible. All of Scripture is God revealing Himself. And if we read it that way, it changes the way we read the Word. It's not about a history of a people. It's not about uh, categorizing human character. It's the story of God. It's God revealing Himself. How does He relate to people? What are His qualities and characteristics? What does He want from us, what are his expectations? If you approach the Bible that way, then you don't get lost in all the, the muck and the mire and the details that scholars want to argue about. <laughs> the, you know, beyond that, then you can talk about ceremonial law, moral law, rules for the nation of Israel, rules for the kingdom of God, you know, in perpetuity. Th those are other questions, but I think it starts with that foundational question of, do you really, if this is God's revealing of himself, why would you want to ignore three quarters of it? Mm -hmm. this is, yeah. Even if you don't understand it all. Yeah, yeah. This is good for me to hear because I'm doing some research now for a sermon on the integrity of God's word. And uh, because the world tries to diminish it all the time, they write it off. Uh, well, what other comments have you got? Yeah. about that with the Old I, Testament, I like New to, Testament? To go back and, and touch a little bit on, on question five, um, again, like we, we talked about before we came on, uh, if, if the person has never spent time in Scripture, l set the Old Testament aside to begin with. Um, as a matter of fact, I just started a sermon series this uh, past Sunday about how to read the Bible. And, and, and when we look at the entirety of Scripture, everything in the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. And then everything in the New Testament points back to Jesus. That Jesus is the central character. Mm -hmm. Because when we see Jesus, we see God. When we learn about this man named Jesus, then that is God's ultimate revelation uh, of himself. And 
um, again, I, I you know, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the, the, the Old Testament isn't relevant. It, right. All of God's word is relevant in each and every situation. But when we look at, well, look at all the things that they did in the Old Testament, we have to understand that was written for a people that lived thousands of years ago. Um, just very quickly, God took this group of people, the Hebrews, out of Egypt and was establishing them as a nation. They spent the last 400 years having other people think for them, other people tell them what to do. Other pe so, so God, in essence, is starting from scratch saying, this is how I want my people to live. That's the Old Testament law. When we come to the New Testament, Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law. Mm -hmm. I've come to fulfill it. So everything that we read about in the Old Testament is ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So we, we go through maybe some of the passages in Leviticus. We say, well, uh, if, uh, if, a, if our son is disrespectful to our parents, we're supposed to drag him to the gate, uh, present him to the elders, and then he's to be stoned to death. <laughs> that was the law back then, yeah. okay? Anything that we read in the New Testament that confirms what we read in the Old Testament, that's something that we should focus sure. on. That's something we should look at. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not supposed to get tattoos for the dead, okay? Jesus never confirmed that. Jesus never talked about it, never addressed that in the New Testament. So, so those we can set aside. Some of the dietary laws we can set aside, again, because those were written to a specific group of people at a specific time. So, so when you look at the Old Testament, don't get caught in the, uh, the muck, I believe you said. Yeah, yeah don't, don't get so caught up yeah. in the things that we read in the Old Testament. Yeah. Focus on Christ, focus on, on what he told us to in other, do. In other words, don't major in the minors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah. What about you, Pastor? So right? I, I think that um, maybe just bits and pieces of what each of you have said that I'd, that I'd kind of bounce off of a little bit. First of all, it, the, the answer to the question, is the Old Testament relevant, is yes. We would all agree with that. There's no question that it is relevant. It is communicating truth about God. This is what you're talking about, Pastor Rich, that it's teaching us about God's character, about his, uh, his story of redemption and renewal and recreation of, uh, of creation. Uh, it's, it, there's no question that it is relevant. Um, I think that, you know, Pastor Chris, to, to address some of what you're saying there, um, we ought to be asking the question about what type of literature we're reading when we read the Bible. You know, one of the things that I teach the people that I am pastoring is that we ought to think of this as more of a library than a book. It's, uh, it's filled with all different types of literature. And, mm -hmm. you know, the reality is if we were to go to the library and pick up a, a textbook, a history textbook and a book of poetry, we would read those two things differently. They would be communicating different things to us in different ways. And we ought to think about that when we read scripture. And a lot of times that comes up in the Old Testament because we're, we're wrestling with what do these things mean for us? These things that were written in a particular context to a particular people, what do they mean for us? And I think it's just good for us to think critically about what, what is the type of literature we're reading and how should we read it? You know, through what lens should we read it? But not discounting that it is teaching us an important truth about who God is. Yeah. All right, good, I think we're good. You had, you had, okay, go ahead. It says, who determined what we still do and don't do. Yeah. The answer to that question is, the Holy Spirit determines what we do and what we don't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. excellent. All right, that wraps it up. Now, another question that, that I think we really ought to address. We are now in a new year, this viewer says, but many families continue to feel the financial pressures from the economic struggles in the previous years. What advice or biblical scriptures can you offer to help ward off the fear and anxiety that some may be facing right now. Think about that. There are over 2,300 scriptures in the Bible that pertain to money. In fact, in the New Testament, there's more said about money than heaven and hell combined. Yeah. yeah. Well, the so, acronym for fear 
Oh, yeah. It's yeah. false evidence yeah. appearing yeah. real. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the number one place to start. And and it's it's so interesting that the the description of faith and fear are the same. It's believing something's going to happen that hasn't happened yet. Mm. So you have to be very careful in that realm. So God did not give us what? A spirit of fear, but of power and mm -hmm. of love and of the sound mind. Mm -hmm. That's where you start. That's excellent. Yeah, it's, a good, it's a good foundation for the, the questions that, or for the answers that you're, you're coming forth with. Two things came to me, uh, of course, classic passage from Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And of course, the passage goes on that God knows our needs and he's going to provide. And it, do we trust him or do we not trust him? And, and then down in chapter 7, this is something that God just confirmed to me in the last six months over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, the whole passage about ask, seek, and knock. You know, mm -hmm. ask and it will be given to you. Seek, seek and you will find. Sure. Knock and it will be open to you. But, but the passage says this in verse 11. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to oh, your yeah. children, yeah. how much more will your heavenly Father who give good things to those who ask Him. Mm -hmm. And the thing that just overwhelmed me in the last six months or so with things going on in, in, in my personal life and losing my mom and, and just some uh, struggles in, in, in life and work, uh, do I really trust the goodness of God? And so when we're praying, when we're seeking, when we're asking, when we're fearful, do, do we part of faith, I would say all of faith, do I trust goodness as a primary characteristic of who God is? And if I do, then I have to believe that God's going to give me what I need and that if God withholds something from me, it's for my benefit. That, that I genuinely have to trust the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. and, and we can believe that. We can hold on to that. We can cling to that. And uh, when the Lord settles that in your spirit and you genuinely believe that God is good and his desire for you is good, you view the world a little bit different. Yes. Very good. One of my favorite passages is in 1 Peter, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Um, and as somebody who suffered through a, a fairly serious bout of anxiety, uh, maybe a little depression thrown in just for for good measure, uh, I can attest to that, the, the, the truth and the accuracy of that statement. Um, fear is a liar, uh, so says the song by, by Zach Williams, and, and it is, and it's so easy to become overwhelmed and to be fearful and, and to let our minds totally run away with us. We begin to doubt God's love for us, we, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. When we focus on, on God and, and His provision, it, it's perfect and it's complete and it comes at His timing. And that may or, or may not uh, help the person struggling economically, um, but I would be willing to say that if, uh, if the person genuinely is, is focusing on Christ, is, is living in the truth of His promises, that will go a long way to, to battling uh, the anxiety that the, the person may be feeling. Did yeah. you want to add to that? Well, I, I just think that, um, you know, this, this whole idea of fear, uh, my, my wife and I talk about the stories we write in our heads and how we, we just have a tendency as humans to be great storytellers, great authors, uh, <laughs> fiction novelists in our, in our minds, right? And we're, uh, we're often experiencing the emotion of things that haven't even happened because of where our minds go. And so I really think the heart of this question, Bill, is, mm -hmm. is trust. Pastor Neil, you mentioned that in security. Where, in what are we placing our trust? Where, is our, where does our security come from? And if it's in worldly things, uh, then we will, we will be disappointed by that. I mean, that's, I think that's the reality of the faith that we live. You know, another, another part of going into a new year 
is people tend to have regrets. They have, uh, and then they have uh, misgivings about the current situation, mm -hmm. and they have anxieties about the future. Yeah. So I, I think that it's, it's, it's important if you're going to move forward in your life to set some plans in place and commit those to God or allow, allow God, more importantly, even allow him to give you his plan and his, his purpose of your, of your life to propel you forward. And when you know what, what it's all about, you know, asking God that question, why on earth am I here? Mm -hmm. and he gives you the answer to that, it, it can dispel a lot of those fears that we have. Do you think? Yeah. For me, the whole process is three steps. Trust God, like Rich said, and then do your best being led by God, mm -hmm. and then trust God for the rest. Yeah. You, I'm not a big one. I, I don't think my dad always gave me things to do, and he trusted me to do them. There's that trust word. And I was expected to do my best because he always said to me, if I didn't have time to do it right the first time, when would I have time to do it over? <laughs> so trust God, do your best, trust God for the rest. Yeah, and yeah. that sums it up. We, we, we all have time too, by the way. And, uh, but but that, that sums it up. Appreciate your dad. Is, is he still with us? Uh, has he gone? He's gone now? Okay. Well, we thank God that he uh, passed that on to you. That's our program for today, and uh, you know what? This same fine panel will be back with us again next week, so if you enjoyed what you heard today, you want to make sure you tune in again next week at the same time. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a wonderful day and the beginning of our new year. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.